All right, let's begin by jogging your memory and go backwards a little in history, um, kind of the basics of, of how you got to where you were. Were you drafted or did you enlist? No, I enlisted. Uh, part of the enlistment uh, for me was, uh, it was a kind of option. I was a juvenile delinquent. So <laughs> in 1965, I mean, my options were, um, uh, I should say 1964. It was a little bit earlier, but I didn't go into that. Uh, in 1964, I was seriously considering the French Foreign Legion because I'd get a new name. Uh, and I guess, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, the Vietnam War started, uh, so I enlisted in 1965. To a uh, couple of things, I was uh, I've always been a, an adrenaline junkie, so um, the idea of, of doing something like that um, was a, a kind of thrill for me. And the other thing, of course, was uh, clearing up the scarlet letter that was attached to my name. Where were you living at the time? I was living in uh, New York City. Okay. And um, why did you join the Army? Why did you join the paratroopers? Well, I, I've, always, I've always taken everything on as a challenge ever since I was a young man. So uh, the idea of pitting myself up against um, fear, against um, you know, uh, what I considered the elite, to see if I could make it, that was all part of my, uh, my rationale, my thinking. And of course, the other thing that was factored in there, if I'm going to war, who would I want to be with? Well, I want to be with the guys who were looking at forward to this as a uh, government-sponsored hunting trip, <laughs> where they'd transport you, give you food, clothing, and, uh, and weapons uh, to go on a hunting trip. So uh, that was the kind of mentality uh, at that point in time of, being a young paratrooper. Do you recall your first days uh, in boot camp and where were you? Uh, my first days in boot camp, I was at, uh, I was at Fort Dix, New Jersey, and uh, that was very, very easy for me. I, that was, you know, it wasn't that challenging. It was, you know, I was, oh, I've always been a, an athlete. I've always trained. I always taken care of myself. So I was, I was, if you will, prepared to go into the military. Um, do you remember any of your instructors or experiences in boot camp? In boot camp, uh, well, the, the only uh, instructor was a Staff Sergeant Jones, who was my uh, drill instructor, and uh, I ran into him almost uh, close to almost three years later when I was just getting out of the military, and I, I was getting out, and I was actually teaching a class uh, in individual technical training at the same Fort Dix, New Jersey. And uh, I was teaching a course in the Viet Cong mines and booby traps that I originally set up in the individual tactical training range. And here came uh, Sergeant Jones back through there, and I was a sergeant at, the, at that time. And uh, we both had a chuckle about uh, you know the two and a half years, or almost three years, since we'd I'd seen him, and of course he saw me as a young know, recruit. So it was different. Why does he stand out in your mind? Well, he's the first uh, official authority figure uh, that you that you come across in the military. And you connected or connected? Uh, well, it was uh, again. I take everything on as a challenge. Uh, you know, he was his role was the hard guy, the tough guy. Well, guess what? My role is to you can't break me. <laughs> and I love those challenges. All right. Um, any other memorable experiences in boot camp? Not really. No, no nothing. Uh, nothing to. Uh, nothing to. No, nothing to shock the world. It was you know, everything that I uh, that I expected. And after that, um, where did you go? Well, here's a little bit of irony. Um, after that, they uh, after boot camp, I had enlisted specifically for airborne to be a paratrooper. Okay. But that leaves you open to any kind of uh, MOS, which means military occupational specialty. Well, the irony is they sent me from uh, boot camp at Fort Dix to MP school in Fort Gordon, Georgia. Well, uh, it was. Pretty interesting, only because I tested well. I, uh, I was a smart kid, and uh, was a smart, actually a smart kid in school who just didn't do anything. Uh, 
coasted my way through high school and through, coasted my way through all schools. But anyway, I got down to the uh, <coughs> MP school in Fort Gordon, Georgia, and I uh, got in there on a Friday and got all the stuff taken care of, you know, all prepared for Monday morning. And in the orientation class on Monday morning, they were talking to the new MP, uh, MP candidates and they were telling us how great we were and how you guys were selected because you're the best and the brightest and somebody walked up to the lectern at that point in time, whispered something and the next thing I know it's Private Weckerly. I raised my hand. No. You're a juvenile delinquent. So they sent me over to uh, uh, airborne infantry training and uh, which I was most pleased about. And in Vietnam, yes. how did you get there? Um, do you remember the trip over? I definitely remember the trip over. Um, I'd gone through jump school, and jump school was uh, jump school and airborne infantry training were the, were the two most integral things, particularly jump school, because jump school uh, that's a, you can you can quit any time you want. So the idea of taking on a challenge, uh, you know, they're looking to break you. And right up through the rank of captain, everybody's treated equally. They're, they're no different by these, uh, what they call tactical NCOs. And uh, they push you, push you, push you. And again, uh, the amount, uh, the attrition rate is probably at least 50% dropouts. You know, quit, can't take it, can't jump out of a plane, can't, can't take the training, can't take uh, the abuse. Um, but the abuse is for a purpose. <coughs> um, and that was one of the standout things for me. I mean, it's, uh, you know, go ahead. You know, you're not going to break me. And again, my thinking was, you know, who, who do you want to be with if you're going into combat? Well, I want to be with these guys who aren't going to break down and quit. So again, uh, the rationale for myself was, you know, uh, was doing that. And again, proving something to myself, too, that I could take on the challenge, that I could, you know, you're not going to break me, and that's integral to the uh, to the me, the person, my character, you know, the whole persona that uh, that was and still is me. Mm. So, once you got to Vietnam, what happened? Well, I'm just going to jump in a minute and, and go back to the trip over to Vietnam. Okay. After after graduating um, on the final jump and everything else, and we were <coughs> everybody who got through there. And, the through jump school. The last day, the guy was talking about everybody there who was in the army anyway, because you have a Marine Force Recon, you have uh, Navy SEALs who go through there also, we all, and whoever makes it. On the last day, um, this Sergeant Malden gave a speech and he said, you know, every guy here is either going to 1st Brigade, 101st Airborne Division if you're in the army, or 173rd Airborne Brigade, <coughs> and you're going, you know, two weeks from now you're going to be in Vietnam. Uh, you know, after you leave. And he, say, he said, I'd be amazed if I saw out of 120 guys here, he said, if 15 of you sorry asses made it back, he said, I'd be amazed. And he said to another guy, dismiss them. And I just, you know, I just I thought that was so comical. I mean, I loved it. You know? mm. uh, again, you know, just throwing down the ultimate challenge gauntlet, you know. Uh, so uh, that was very, very much appreciated. Now getting to the ride over to Vietnam, uh, we left out of McGuire Air Force Base, and again it was basically a plane load uh, of, of guys who I had all graduated with. We were all going to Vietnam, and all the paratroopers, and uh, we were on a chartered uh, plane, and I can't remember, I believe it, it might have been Pan Am at the time. Um, and the next step from McGuire Air Force Base was <coughs> San Francisco International Airport at which point uh, we had like a two-hour layover because they had to fuel up and do whatever they had to do. Uh, again, the irony there was here, myself and a couple of other buddies got out of the plane, we walked into the meeting, walked up to the bar. They wouldn't serve us a beer or a drink because we were not yet 21 years old. So here you are. Okay, going over to fight a war for your country. 
Uh, oh, by the way, you could also drive. I could also drive a car at the time, and I could drink back in New York at the age of 18. But here you are going off to war, and you can't buy a drink. Oh, also, I couldn't even vote for the President of the United States who was sending me over there at that point in time. So I think there was a lot of, um, if you hear bitterness and resentment, and uh, yes. So we wound up going to uh, paying a cab driver to take us to a liquor store, get us liquor, and uh, between San Francisco and Honolulu, um, it was <laughs> obliterated because we were all trashed with a couple of bottles of uh, Jim Beam. Once you got to Vietnam, yes. Tell me about connecting with your unit and sure. how soon you engaged in the direct activities. Okay. Um, Getting to Vietnam, uh, we came over into Tan Sanut uh, Air Base, which is in Saigon, mm -hmm. and uh, then they sent us to a place called 90th Replacement Detachment, which is in Benoit, just a little bit north of Saigon, uh, and awaiting orders when the, the unit would pick you up and uh, bring you up to the unit. Well, that happened within about a week. Uh, and they sent us up to uh, uh, the base. The first 101st Airborne Division was just one brigade in Vietnam. There was not a whole division uh, at that point in time. We got up. They had one base camp. It was in a place called Phan Rang, Vietnam, and uh, we reported in there. And they had. Uh, I think the biggest thing that stood out to me at that point in time was the. They had what they call a P train, which is preparation training. And again, it was just like jump school. They're trying to make you or break you, but they're also trying to uh, get you used to, obviously, the climate, the jungle climate, and the heat, the humidity, the everything else. Uh, one of the things that stand out to me in that uh, one week of training before we went out into the actual joint or field units was the idea of stay alert, stay alive. It was just drilled into your head, and it was just, uh, yes, it was a very... Very good. It was almost like a mantra. So uh, we did so. The next, uh, after getting out of there, they sent us directly out to our units. I was assigned to uh, A Company, 2nd 327th Airborne Infantry, uh, 1st Platoon. Uh, got out to the unit, and uh, I don't know, much to my, not, not sh well, I guess somewhat shock. I'll use the current term since it's 2012, shock and awe. Got there and there were guys uh, who had scalps tied on their M16s. Guys wearing necklaces made out of ears. Guys who collected um, gold teeth from um, the kills. So it was like, uh, it, it, to me, it was like a scene from, uh, I don't know how, how you describe the scene. It was just, uh, yeah. did I understand? Yeah, okay. Uh, I understood. I mean, I understood what the, ra if you will, if there's a rationale behind gory stuff. You know, without asking, I mean, you picked up the message right away. Uh, but it was interesting. These are the things that most uh, Mr. and Mrs. America did. Uh, didn't know about or certainly didn't want to hear about. Uh, one of the things that, uh, in speaking with the guys, this was you know kind of commonly done. If you're going to mess with us, these are the things that are going to happen. And uh, that happened. And when I first got to the unit, everybody, you're the new kid, so I was well, like one of the original replacements in 1966, uh, going into you know, September of 1966. And uh, you wind up getting all the stuff dumped on you. I was uh, the uh, ammo bearer for the machine gun for a while. And then I, I looked around, and the easiest job that I saw, and again, this is the uh, scheming young, young guy who was uh, who had a half a brain, but who, who loves adrenaline also. And I saw so that the guy who carries the least was the point man. And that's the guy who walks in front. Uh, 
only because he's you know, he's got he's responsible for you know leading the, the cast of characters. Well, the guy uh, <clears throat> the guy who was the two persons, uh, the, the point man who was there, the existing point man, and his slack man, which is the second guy, right, who walks right behind him, that's his backup, were rotating out within a month. So I became uh, the understudy uh, to them. And uh, when they, what they call de roast, which means return to the United States, when they de roast, um, I took over uh, as the point man. And my slack man, the guy who was directly behind me, was a guy who came into the country with me named Ray Collier. And he became my backup. How do you spell this last name? C O L L I E R. Thank you. Uh, Ray Collier became my slack man again because of the uh, trust and everything else. My, you know, my life is in his hands, his life is in my hands. So there, you know, there's a great deal of trust, and there's no, um, just to, not to go off topic, but there's, I, I don't think, any greater um, connection to um, brotherhood, to sisterhood, than the situation where you could be in life or death situation at any moment. There's no greater love or feeling or emotion that you can uh, feel between individuals. I don't even think in, in marriage or anywhere else. It's just a... It's a unique, it's a unique brotherhood, sisterhood uh, that's shared. Uh, and again, uh, to this day, uh, I still find that uh, very, very unique and uh, very, very defined. So uh, those kind of things were commonplace. One of the things that uh, we did carry, uh, and Tim O'Brien's book. <coughs> The things they carry is, is to me, number one, uh, I'm not a big war reader. Um, I am a reader. I am a, a kind of um, literature buff. I certainly teach writing and literature. And uh, I also uh, do a lot of writing. Uh, writing has always been cathartic for me, even prior to the military. So the idea of, of combining these different things meant a lot to me, but Tim O'Brien's book, which is uh, considered a, for my many fiction, but to me, it's fiction with the truest meaning I've ever heard about the experience of war that was shared uh, by things that I'd seen, by things that I'd done, by things that I'd witnessed. So to me, it is the, uh, an epic and true description uh, of war, uh, tone, uh, told uh, through the eyes of some fantasy, but with the ultimate message about what war truly is. Uh, uh, you, you send, you know, us little American kids out there and, you know, we're just as nasty and mean and afraid, but you know what? I want to make you more afraid. I'm going to show you. And that's kind of what uh, what to find it. I mean, it wasn't uh, a question. I had nothing against, I truly didn't, nothing against what was defined as the bad guys. I mean, I saw the bad guys, if you will, uh, as pawns, just as we were pawns being used, uh, yeah, with the idea of, uh, at the time, I guess the favorite word was domino democratization. Um, <laughs> Or in this particular, the spread of communism, you know, uh, we were doing this. Well, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> it, it didn't work. But again, my rationale was if I had to be there and I wanted to clear up my bad record, this was a place to do it. And I enjoy crazy stuff. So I did that. One of the things that Tim O'Brien uh, did not speak about in the book, uh, which is truly integral to what I was saying about and I'm not going to call it atrocities, I'm going to call it reality. Mm -hmm. um, well, what we had and we put on the bodies mm -hmm. of the ones we killed, these are called death cards. And here are the death cards. 
And one, it used to be the aces phase, it used to be the, one of the dark aces. And the other one is, it says, uh, again, it's like a call, it's like Have Gun Will Travel was that uh, popular TV show of those mid-60s and early 60s time. The other one is Compliments of Thunderballs, No Slack Battalion, Have Bullet Will Bury. And it says So Sung, which means relentless. So when we kill you, okay, you also get a calling card on you. And then we also take, if one of our, one of my fellow soldiers takes off your head and, um, or decapitates you or does something else, or just, we want to take your body and possibly put your body up against uh, a trail and you're hitchhiking and put this screaming eagle patch in your mouth, which we took off our uniform, to leave a calling card. It sounds horrendous, but it's a horrible fact of life, of the reality of war and what happens. Now the idea of, and, I, and I'll be more specific about this because I want to be more specific about this, the idea of killing innocents was something that we did not do. If you killed someone who was innocent in our group, if that had been done, we would probably have killed you because we, that, that was not done. It was an understanding and that it was maybe unique to the unit and again this is my own myopic world that I'm describing. But uh, those are the things uh, that went on. Before I left for Vietnam, <clears throat> my mother had uh, asked me to go get a portrait done at uh, Macy's in Herald Square. And uh, I, I guess she was presuming this might be the last fi uh, picture of her beloved son. So, uh, and there's, uh, there's irony to this thing also. Uh, because um, I, I didn't have any of these, these things. Um, my mother was dying of cancer in the late uh, 1980s. And I'd asked her, I said, Mom, uh, my father passed away early. He passed away in 1974. And I asked my mother, I said, uh, do, can I have, do you, do you have the copies of, of letters and stuff like that that I sent home? And my mother said to me, you never wrote. And then, uh, <laughs> all I do recall, I, I did recall at that point, number one, I, I felt horrible, because here's my mother who was, if you will, dying. Uh, and then, it, it came back to me. I was in country and out in the jungle about three months and hadn't written, and all of a sudden a helicopter came in and they asked us to cut an, an actual landing zone. And somebody from the Red Cross came out, Michael I don't give a shit what you write. Write something for your mother and father. And uh, that's what happened. So I, I, I guess I wrote the one letter home. Uh, the point being for me, and I'll just uh, describe it for me, was I couldn't see the point in writing home. I mean, what am I going to tell you about? I know what you're doing back here. It's September, it's you know, October 1966. Okay, my brother's back in high school. My mother's working at Macy's, and my father's a cop. Okay, I know exactly what's going on. The leaves are starting to turn. Okay, what, what am I going to tell you about? You know, uh, Tommy just got shot this morning, or, or, you know, what do you want me to describe? How miserable things are? How, you know, there, there, was, no, there was no point. And the other idea was, I really don't want to know, because I have to stay focused. I have to be one-dimensional. I don't care what's happening, you know, 12,000 miles away. I can't let that impact me. So, uh, what do you call it, self? And I was unique that way because I think, I, and again, I am a writer, and I was a writer at that point in time. But uh, many of the guys, uh, I, I know you'd see detail, would write, be writing detailed letters about what happened. And, uh, you know, and they'd get these huge letters from home, and you'd see them. But that wasn't me. I just, uh, I, did I like getting letters from home? Yes, I did. 
But uh, the idea of me sharing uh, this information or me communicating, no, it did not happen. And I, I did feel terrible about that at that point in time. There's a, a transition uh, in pictures, the one I, <coughs> I just described, uh, this is prior to, and then there's a picture taken, some, uh, a group picture, and this was some four months later, and uh, they talk about the thousand yard stare in the face of war. Uh, these are some things that I'll, uh, I'm going to submit. To, to this. But you can see the transition from this proud young, you know, trooper who just graduated from this elite thing. And then you see the transition in the faces of these same young men some four months later. And you look at the difference. Look how the age or the reality has, uh, has moved things. Do you remember any of the people in there specifically? Oh, absolutely. You want to just them. list them off while you while we oh, think about it? Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, yes. Sergeant Browning, uh, Gore, uh, Doc, <coughs> Benito Garcia, Pennington, uh, <coughs> Mike Crook, Sergeant Sims. I, I, I think you're going. Ray Collier, my slack man, right there. Uh, Where? Ray Collier is right over here. Third from the right. Third from the, the right. Second from the top row, right over here, Benito Garcia, my dear friend. Okay. Uh, and of the uh, of all of the people, and there are many of these are uh, Mike Gore over here. Uh, middle row, third from the left. Uh, all guys, um, these are guys who uh, did, did make it uh, back. Uh, Benito Garcia, the person in the top row, um, had been there when the war started. He was sent over in 1965. He was, um, he spent over three years straight in Vietnam. He never came back to the United States. He was one of those persons who were caught up in, uh, he was a wonderful soldier, but mm -hmm. caught up in the, addicted. He was shot, he had five, he has five Purple Hearts. Um, he was shot right next to me the last time I saw him in uh, somewhere in early August of 1967. We were sitting down and uh, we got sh shots were going way over us, but we weren't concerned. And uh, he was shot right next to me. And we were sitting against uh, on rucksacks and having a cigarette, and he got shot right through his right arm and went underneath my legs and missed me. And that was uh, the last time I had seen him until uh, we had a. <clears throat> there was a uh, when they dedicated the wall in Washington D.C. Uh, the wall and the statues and everything else. Mm -hmm. Guy came up to me and uh, said, hey, Wack. And I turned around, here's this little guy in a three-piece suit with gray hair, which I didn't have at that time. And, uh, he said, and I said, you're going to hum a few more bars. I'm, I'm, I'm lost. And uh, he said, it's Benito. I said, Benito? I, I said, where have you been? Working in a salt mine in Siberia? I said, you look <laughs> I said, I can't believe you're still alive. Uh, and I couldn't believe he was still alive. Because when he got shot that time, that was Purple Heart number three, when he got shot through the arm. Uh, he stayed, came back from the hospital after we had rotated. And he came over, the, you know, he, again, he never went home, never mm -hmm. went back to the United States. So he continued the story, and uh, you know we, we were talking, comparing notes at the time. And I was uh, I was a cop at the time, uh, working in the South Bronx, in a place called Fort Apache. That's to be continued in another moment. <coughs> but uh, Benito uh, got out of the hospital, went back to Nam, and then he got shot two more times, and then finally he came back to the United States, and uh, he get, finally got out of the army uh, as a PFC. <laughs> because uh, wild men, this is what happens to wild men. But uh, when Benito did get out, he, uh, he was 
we were comparing notes, so this is 1984, and we're speaking about, well, what are you doing? Well, I'm doing this. He said, well, he said, well what do you do when you get out? I said, you know, because I, I went back, I started going back to school to CCNY, and I started, you know, taking classes, and I took a job on the cops, um, only because I needed work, I needed to finance myself. So uh, I, I was giving him that story, and I asked Benito what he was doing. You know, he lived in Chicago. He was a Tex-Mex who happened to live in Chicago. And uh, so Benito said, well, he said, you know, I was bagging groceries, I was driving cabs. My, uh, my girlfriend, who became my wife, got pregnant. You know, we had a kid, we ran out of money. So he said, so what do you do when you need money? He said, I robbed six banks. So... I started chuckling because I was saying to myself, number one, I couldn't believe the guy was still alive. And then number two, I, I, I do I absolutely, absolutely, it just made sense to me. He said um, he didn't get caught, um, but he did get caught. The uh, FBI, whoever, his father was a uh, sheriff in Cook County, and I have newspaper articles which I'll show okay. to back up all this information. And uh, his father, found out where he was staying back there in their original hometown in Texas. And his father, being a sheriff in Cook County, said, you know, hey, Bay, you can go across the border into Mexico back to the old family, or you're coming in with me. He turned himself into his father. And he did uh, seven and a half years in jail at the federal penitentiary for bank robbery. So, at which time he got his degree in social work <laughs> and uh, became the uh, uh, City of Chicago uh, Youth Gang Services Task Force Manager. So how appropriate. You know? mm -hmm. Who could relate to violence, who could relate to all these different things. Benito Garcia was one of the persons whose favorite thing was beheading, beheading those we killed. Walking around with a trophy and uh, and so on, so he's uh, a unique character who I still am in contact with, and uh, we're still dear friends, and uh, it's unique. Hmm. Tell me about some of the other items you have. Okay, some of the uh, <clears throat> some of the other items. This uh, some of the proud items beside the death cards. Uh, the one uh, I guess that's ultimately. Uh, the original jump wings, which everybody, we're very, very proud of. These are untouched, and it, it, it's like that elite club that you join that you never want to lose. The other things that were uh, uh, interesting, uh, this is what they call a P-38 can opener. Of course, the dog tags. And uh, the other thing that I used to wear beside the dog tag, um, I'm an agnostic. I've been an agnostic probably since the age of about six years old, hmm. at which point in time, you know, uh, you know, I was, you know, I'd have nightmares and I'd tell my mother and father, my father's Roman Catholic, my mother was uh, Episcopalian, uh, having nightmares. There's no such thing as, you know, no, there's no such thing as boogeyman, no such thing as ghosts, and then I'd go to religious classes and they tell you, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and they're all in one person, and I get, get all confused. So this character who's always questioned authority, didn't buy into the religious package. But anyway, part of the religious package was the chaplains giving out stuff in Vietnam. Well, two of the things, and by the way, the Catholics have the most money. So the Catholic chaplain gave these trinkets out and uh, on two separate occasions. And uh, again, this tremendous, uh, I chuckle, but of course, the agnostic is still holding on to them because you know, I'll hedge my bet. But again, there's, uh, there's some irony to the fact in what these medals, medallions say, these little amulets that I hold. One says, is a, is a picture of, uh, it says, St. Michael, patron saint of paratroopers, protect us. Well, I didn't know St. Michael was around when guys were jumping out of airplanes. So here's St. Michael with parachutes floating all behind him. And the other one is uh, a depiction of probably Mary, and she's standing on top of a globe with a parachute behind her, and it says, Our Lady, Queen of Angels, defend us in combat. So, 
Although, I, again, I, I, I had a chuckle and I, have, I, I, I I'm still have these little trinkets, these amulets, these talisman. Um, who knows? They've also been to um, Iraq and Afghanistan with a young Marine who asked me for these. And uh, I granted them to him with the caveat that whatever happens to him, these come back to me no matter what. I don't care what they do with your body, but I want these tokens back. So. Did he come back? And he came back. And these came back. So these have been uh, a lot of places, and uh, I was uh, happy to see that they worked for this young man. Hmm. So, which is which is great, which is great. Uh, another thing, these are <coughs> some other little things. Make sure you're aware of. Uh, during my time, uh, we were called nomads in Vietnam. The first brigade, hundred first, were nomads. And we carried anywhere from three days to nine days worth of rations. That's a case and a half of sea rations plus what they call LERP units. This was a this was your barbecue stove. And you put a heat tablet in there or C4 in there and heat your food. So this is one of the things that I saved. Here is um, this was a knife taken off a, not an NVA soldier, but a, a, a Viet Cong soldier who uh, unfortunately shot at us, shot at me um, and us, uh, but I happened to be pointing and walking, well, I wasn't on a trail, and that's one thing I never did was take a trail, but, uh, and he happened to be wearing a lavender sweater. Why wearing a lavender sweater? But most people aren't aware of it. But if you get into the mountains of Vietnam, it can be quite cold at certain times of year. But he was carrying this in the lavender sweater. And the lavender sweater, um, I don't know what happened to it. I lost it a number of years ago. This is an old, my original boonie hat, which you wore on a patrol. This. <clears throat> raggedy garment is the last jacket I wore before leaving Vietnam in September of 1967 and I just it's one of those things you'll notice that it's all ripped up and shredded well one of the things was you know they'd always if you needed something new if you needed a new shirt you know new pants they'd always drop that out of a helicopter for you along with the sea rations but the idea was why would you do that and this has been with me through all of this so you keep these things and these are the good luck charms this is the security blanket this is a teddy bear and the most important things on here the most important things to be proud of for me <clears throat> the jump wings, the CIB, and that patch, which is unique, which is, we are, we are it. We are the unit. The other item I have, and I was in a hospital I, uh, in a place called Queen Yan, and uh, I had amoebic dysentery, because I never used Halzone tablets uh, in my water. <laughs> So I developed dysentery, and uh, after uh, almost a week, they finally it medically evacuated me. I was in a hospital in Quinn Yan, and they treated me. And while I was being treated, they have a, it was a field hospital, and there was a, uh, a Vietnamese tailor there. And this jacket was made up. I had to make up this jacket, and it cost me, I think, seven bucks, which was pretty good. It's a silk jacket. So that's another little souvenir. Of the uh, of the wartime, there are other pictures <coughs> that I'll have uh, that I can I, I can show, which I'm going to uh, donate uh, or to use for the display. And uh, these are again integral to the operation. Here's a picture. After 56 straight days in the jungle, here is a picture taken and. Uh, this happens to be the Protestant chapel. We were out for 56 straight days before 
we came back in. And, uh, they gave us two days off, and here I am on the beach. Now, this was about uh, seven, uh, eight, seven or eight months into being in the country. And you could look at this skinny, emaciated young lad sitting there uh, instead of that handsome devil that was at Macy's taking a picture with a big chest. So, again, the transition, the transition, and, and what the true picture of war is and means are captured in, in, in just images themselves. These are pictures uh, of a gathering in 1984 at that same um, monument. Uh, this was our company commander. Uh, here I am attired in my disco Miami Vice suit to the right over here with uh, two of my uh, buddies who are in a different company, but, but both serve with the 101st. Anybody from your unit with you? Uh, I'm going to show that picture okay. in a moment. Yes, I will. Ah, here is the reunion I just described earlier with Benito Garcia. That's Benito Garcia and Tommy LaCastro. Three of those guys that were in the original picture that made it both there. They all made it back in there. That's the first time we had seen each other since 1967. And what year was that, 1982? That was 1984. In D.C.? In D.C. So it's unique. And then, uh, this was two summers ago, two summers ago, so it would be 2010. Myself and Benito Garcia, uh, here in Connecticut. Uh, again. He had come to a visit? Yes. So those are some of the, uh, just some of the other portraits. There's some portraits here of uh, people speak about, and I can attest to what must be Agent Orange. Here's a picture of somewhere around San Mao, Fan Thiet. Somebody sent me, a friend who was with um, um, a different, he was with headquarters of uh, the LERP team, sent me these. These were in April, <coughs> April of 67. And to give you an idea, Vietnam, as most people know it, is jungle. Well, this is a little bit of proof that Agent Orange was in fact, I believe, used. I don't know that. I'm just making a statement here. But it looks like you're walking in Arizona. stories you have uh, anything you very say? very pronounced yes I'll, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you two two I'll give you one very 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 real story okay uh, this was somewhere in the vicinity of uh, June or July of 1967 one of the most pronounced times I can think about uh, a story that still sticks with me. I wrote about it, I've, I've written about it, and it's, it's just a factual story. We had a brand new lieutenant uh, who was sent out to us. Our lieutenant um, uh, was sent back, you know, to a different spot. And uh, this new guy came out. He was an airborne ranger from West Point. And he would not, uh, he was one of those persons who uh, was uh, immediately took charge without uh, listening. So there was uh, resentment from the fact that we'd all been there, most of the overwhelming majority of guys who were there. And he came out uh, with us and he was going to take charge. You know, we, things, things you do and things you don't do. Um, if you're an effective leader, the first thing I want to do is listen. Look, learn, listen. I, I, want, to, I want to know. I want to learn more. Um, you know, the classroom is one environment but the, uh, the practicum of being outside and doing the other thing 
is integral. Again, and listening is integral to being a leader. That's how someone becomes an effective leader. Well, he didn't do that, and his uh, all his trademarks were uh, take a trail. You know, we, we're going to use trails. We have to make time. Well, I've been walking point, and we'd all been doing these things. We don't take trails, uh, sir. You know, we, we don't do this. And we worked in, the 101st worked in small units. The biggest we ever worked was usually platoon size. And most of the time we even split the platoon uh, into, you know, anywhere from 15 when you split the platoon to, you know, maybe 30 guys maximum, you know, uh, would be together. <clears throat> but anyway, he, uh, he spoke about that and uh, one day he'd been there a couple of weeks and uh, we had a new guy replaced because we had to, one of our guys uh, who were killed. I can't even remember names, and that's the other thing that is very, very haunting to me this day is the idea of of names and uh, of those killed. Um, still to this day, I mean, I, I think about the people, and I can put a face. I, I have everything else, but. There's one thing that I that I effectively did, and I don't know when it was effective, but it was a defense mechanism. You know, I could love you, you're my brother, but if you get killed today, I have to step over your body, and I've got to keep going. Okay? I've got to do it for me. I can't dwell on it. I can't. I can't do that. I've got to get through it. So uh, a lot of the names, you know, uh, were not there. But anyway, the uh, one day. Heli they had us cut again a little bit of a landing zone LZ for the helicopter, and they drop out a dog, a dog handler, and a new kid you know, to, as a replacement. And this same idiot lieutenant said to me, "The dog and the dog handler are going to walk point." I said, "No, sir. No." I said, "No, sir." I said, I don't trust the dog, and I don't trust the dog, I don't know who you are. So a little bit of an argument pursued, I was, a, I was the junior sergeant, but the senior, um, senior sergeant came in and was you know, trying to smooth things out. So the compromise was, I would walk point, but I would have to take this little trail, this little dirt animal trail. Uh, well, started taking the trail, and again, it's something we hadn't done. My Ray Cotty and my slack man was behind me, and the dog and the dog handler were the third person back. They couldn't have gone a couple of hundred meters when, boom, the dog handler stepped on a landmine. Um, we hit the ground, it was, everybody does, you know, hit the ground when you heard the explosion. Know what happened, and we went running back Ray and I went running back, and everybody came running up to where the dog and dog handler was. <clears throat> was his leg had been completely blown off, almost just short of his hip, and it was completely gone. And he was uh, loaded with shrapnel. The dog was laying on its side, and the dog uh, was filled with shrapnel. But we couldn't get to the dog handler because the dog was on its side, and it was a beautiful German ship, and it was growling and. and Here's the person who's killed people, I've killed many people. Um, I couldn't shoot the dog. So I said to my slide, I said to Ray, I said, Ray, ice the dog, pop the dog. Ray shot the, you know, shot the dog in the head. And the dog handler let out a howl. It wasn't even about his leg. He felt the pain. His best friend, his, his, his everything, his world. Uh, it was horrible. And then uh, we got him evacuated. Then the dog evacuated with him in, in a medevac helicopter. Uh, this is this is all happening uh, one time. <clears throat> all right after he's evacuated, this same uh, lieutenant tells me, "Take a, take a squad." And uh, he wanted me to do a, a reconnaissance mission. So I took five guys with me. Uh, one, one radio guy, Ray Collier, my slack man. And I took this new kid with me to do a reconnaissance down by this river. It was about a half a kilometer away from where uh, the, other, the other guys were going to continue to move. Uh, as we were Going down, I was I was coming out down upon a river. Two NVA soldiers were just crossing the river, coming out of the river. And 
they probably just got done bathing. In fact, one had his shirt off. And they heard, they must have heard us breaking the brush. They jumped up, grabbed the AK-47s. I, I killed one. He went in the river. The other one we hit, but he got away. The, you know, everybody hears the gun, the shooting, and they were half a kilometer away. The radio's going crazy. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? And, uh, <clears throat> You know, we told him, you know, you know to got one, you know, one, one, one killed, you know, got one body count. We used to call it body count. It's again, dehumanizing whatever it is, and that's the idea. Any crazy, funny things that you want to share? I mean, we've talked about some serious things. Crazy, funny things would be absolutely. I mean, because, you know, again, it's, uh, uh, <clears throat> there's nothing like, uh, to me, like living life on the edge where <laughs> it's, it's uh, because the good times and the good times and the bad times are magnified, and they uh, they're in full color, they're in full dimension. And the episode to me, it is no more more creativity or, or broad-minded than when you're exposed to danger. I mean, you laugh at the little, the smallest things, and uh, and that's that. I mean, one of the craziest things was my friend Benito. We had a, a stand down one time with the uh, Marines. In a, in a place called uh, Chu Lai at the uh, Marine Enlisted Man's Club, and there was a ceiling fan. Well, Benito climbed up on a bar, jumped on the ceiling fan, was swinging around on the ceiling fan, urinating on what he called the inferior Marines. So uh, that started a great big brawl. But we, there were a lot of those, uh, you know, funny times, and everybody had a nickname and. Uh, it, it was it was it was that way. It, it was there were many many good times. Would I trade my experience? Would I would I change that? No, I wouldn't. Uh, I would not because I mean I was never so alive as when I was so near death. The negative to that is, well, how do you achieve that again? And uh, you truly don't. I mean, the one good thing on my own particular part is when I did get out. Um, of the military, um, and again, there's irony to the, that fact because they, during the whole time, because again, I was a, a fairly smart kid when I, before I went into the military, and I took all the military tests, but because I was a, <laughs> a, a juvenile delinquent, it, it excluded me from Officer Kennedy School, from flights, Warren Officer Flight School, from so on. When I was getting out, because they needed bodies, uh, they interviewed me and they said, look, you can pick whatever Officer candidate class you want. I said, you, you, they said your scores are off the charts here, you know, for picking. I said, well, too late now. You know, I'm done. But I got out of the military and to go back to college, I took a job with the, uh, took a civil service exam and again, I came out very high on it. <clears throat> took a job in the New York City Police Department. But again, the irony there was once I got out of the police academy, where they assigned me? Well, the most violent precinct in the history <laughs> of New York City. Which was probably a great place for me to be because it was all the craziest people just like me. And I'm not talking about, but the experience was, uh, was very, it wasn't dissimilar to my war experience. It'd be like getting up uh, every day, leaving at the time I was uh, living on Long Island. But you'd leave your quiet little picturesque home in fence drive 45 minutes, and you'd be in a combat zone. You'd be in a combat zone. You, you'd, you'd be in an area where, where life is cheap, where uh, from 1969 to the late 1970s, 78, 79, 80, in one square mile that the precinct covered, there used to be 130 to 150 homicides a year. It was just uh, a, a place that, but again, the adrenaline, it was wonderful. But the idea of, of winding down and winding up every single day, well, how do you go from the combat zone to go home? And then I, I was having you know, my family, I started a family, and I had a son and daughter. And are you going from, well, what's, wait a minute, what's normal? 45 minutes from here is, what's normal? Well, that's normal there, but this is normal here. So you have this juxtapose in, uh, in what's going on. So it, uh, there was a, a lot to be said for that experience too. I, I mean, it was fulfilling, but uh, 
difficult and challenging. To kind of pull some of this together, mm -hmm. you mentioned you got out of the service. Do you remember what happened that day? I mean, you were given more tests, or did you come back to the States and then were you put on a base here? Oh, when I got back, yeah. I was uh, reassigned to uh, uh, 82nd Airborne Division before the Iraq. Okay. I'd actually put in for, I had, uh, I was in the hospital for uh, a month, I had malaria. <clears throat> And that's in North Carolina, Fort Bragg is in North Carolina, and then I, from there, they, I was transferred to Fort Dix, New Jersey, where I was uh, teaching at the uh, Individual Tactical Training Range, and that's where I got out of the military. Okay. When you look back on things mm -hmm. and you think about the experience. Do you think it changed your perspective of life? Do you think it, it had me? How do you look at the war experience in retrospect? Can you summarize something like that? An utter waste. Uh, an utter waste. I mean, I, I look at, uh, and this is the philosophical me, examining it, and you know, we could look out the window right now, I could look up at the sky right now, and. Uh, you know, those bad guys you know, mm -hmm. could look up, you know, look up at the sky and they see the same thing I do. We breathe the same air, we drink the same water, we drink, you know, we do things. I mean, who, who, who declares, who, who colors somebody good, bad? Because somebody has a different set, a different ideology or a different philosophy in, in, in governments. I mean, it seems like governments, uh, I don't know what causes the most wars. I've always kind of, in my own mind, even, as, even back then, you know, debated, you know, what's the cause of most wars? Well, this is my own personal opinion, but I viewed it then as this. Okay, it's, it's probably, religion is number one, and then probably uh, property based on country and, and, and culture are the next two greatest causes of war. You know, possession of land or possession of water. That's it. Yes, I mean, the idea of... Uh, if you will, <laughs> the, the idea, how about the ideal of coexistence is always prevalent in my mind. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't change my experience, but it, it, it's colored my world to make me cynical about, uh, you know, well, who's right and who's wrong. You know? I, who's, you know, I, I challenge things. I always question things. I, I question the relativity of um, certainly our, our action initially in, in Iraq. Uh, you know, as a veteran, as a, well, not forget, forget being a veteran. As an American, I have that right to question that. And I think that's, that's very, very important to, uh, to everyone. You know, to take a look at things, look at the facts, you know, break it down, just get through the rhetoric, and also look at it from an outside perspective, not just a United States perspective, but get information from all different sources. Uh, and see what it's about. An informed opinion. Don't be, don't be let along. Anything else you'd like to add, John? No, I, I just like to um, say that I certainly, when I say this to, I speak with younger veterans. I think there's one thing that I'm very, very conscious about, and that's my how I relate to, and and uh, the current veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan. My war wasn't greater than their war. My war wasn't bigger than their war. Unlike when we came back, where I had a father and uncle who were in World War II, who used to speak about Korea as a, it wasn't a war, it was a police action. Or Vietnam. That was a conflict. Huh? What? Huh? So there's, uh, on my part, this resentment about the treatment that uh, not just we received, but I remember my, my, the treatment of the Korean vets also. And uh, how, well, it wasn't a real, a real war. Well, just because it didn't make Tom Brokaw's greatest generation, oh well, why don't you try it out? Uh, you know, you, you don't know. My father happened to be an MP who was guarding General MacArthur, so I don't think he had a real tough time. My uncle was a supply sergeant in Europe. Okay. 
what do you want to tell me about war? So if anything, uh, you know, with the uh, relating to the folks who are serving right now, and, and I, I think fortunately, because there are male and female, we're equal opportunity. Uh, maybe folks will truly look at war and, and what it does and its impact on those people. And I think you're getting a, a more genuine face now because of the incorporation of, of gender. Because my experience, my trauma is no greater than the, I think about the, when I was in the hospitals, the young nurses who saw us all shot to pieces, who saw us, you know, who saw men dying, young, same age, we're all, we're all the same age, they're a year or two older than us because they went to a nursing program. Is their trauma any less or greater? I don't know. It's at least equal to that. So I see that's the way I see that. Okay. Great. I thank you very much, and we'll call it a wrap. Thank you.